So on your side, you'll see it also. So please make sure you hit the got it. But today we're gonna to start our kitchen table conversations here at the Farm Science Review. We are live and also virtual. With me today is Bruce Clevenger of Defiance County, who was the A&R educator there. And my cohort in crime, Heather Nykirk, is in her office in Stark County, and she'll be helping to manage the chat and uh, give input also. I'm Gigi Neal with OSU Extension in Claremont County. It's the Agriculture and Natural Resource Educator. So today's topic is on uh, the devil's in the detail that communication and record keeping for improving your farm management. And what we want you to do is please unmute yourself, ask questions. We want this to be a conversation. We are sitting at our kitchen table here. You might be at yours also or somewhere else in the comfort of maybe your work environment or your home. But please feel free to type in the chat and also to uh, unmute and ask questions. Bruce? Hey, thanks, Gigi. Thanks, Heather, for coordinating this. Uh, you know, as we came up with the topic, uh, the devil's in the detail, I think maybe it gives too much credit to the devil, but really I think the essence of that is, you know, can we get in trouble? Can we find ourselves in a quandary of, of indecisiveness because the details about our record keeping and record keeping can be a lot of things. I think the first thing that people go to when it comes to record keeping is, is often, I think, financial record keeping. But there are so many other things about farm businesses that are also non-financial that are important in record keeping. But regardless, there's going to have to be a level of detail that the second part of the topic was the conversations and the communication that has to occur, in my opinion, within the farm business. And so the kitchen table is a great venue to talk about this because that's a lot of times where, in fact, these, these family conversations, business conversations are happening. And if not everybody is on the same page as far as what level of detail does our business need to operate in, I really believe that that can be a, a level of frustration. And so one example might be, um, would be if we are having a stereotypical person in the business in charge of entering the records or the financial transactions. And then we have another person that would be maybe reading the reports that come out of that financial system. So if, if the two levels are not in sync with each other, somebody that's reading the report might say, what is all this information? Or they might also be saying, where is all the information? So there's a level of confusion there between what's being entered and what's being uh, reported and then reported. And so one of the background information, we wanna make sure that we know why we're keeping records to begin with on the farm. And I've kind of coined a phrase called record keeping do more than a tax return, because I really feel that a tax return is the bare necessity of why we would ever have to keep a record keeping system on the farm. Um, I'll go further and say that the Schedule F record that we give to the IRS is the worst financial statement that you can make or have that would truly represent the farm business. The IRS is interested in the income and expenses. And the IRS though is not really interested in truly the farm profitability or really the decisions that you're making. They just want the form filled out. And this is kind of, I don't know, passive aggressive in saying this, but they just want you to fill out the form and report the income in which the tax is gonna be based on. So we can do more. And, and the reason why I think we can do more is because we already have our books open at that time of year. And so if we dive a little deeper into that farm record keeping system, it can really show and showcase really so much more about the farm business and what it has to offer to make decisions. And so doing more than a tax return, I believe is very important. So that's, as far as why we keep records, that's a bare minimum. So to go beyond that, we may want to in, in incentivize ourselves to take the next step. Well, what does the lender need at least every year? Well, the lender's gonna need a, maybe some income statement. They're gonna know, wanna know those financial transactions. They're also wanna, probably gonna have on a farm, they're gonna wanna see a, a balance sheet. And so those are helpful in determining really the, 
uh, the financial ability of the farm and the financial uh, stability of the farm as well, doing some financial statements. And so if we already have the books open to do the tax return, it's my opinion, and, and, and I think it's valuable to go the next step and do record keeping just a little bit more. So that might involve some more details, and that's where the devil in the detail comes back into why we keep records. But another reason why we keep records is that we might need to really analyze what we're doing on the farm. My wife and I and family, we farm a little bit, and there are times when I'm really um, wondering, why do I spend so much time on my nights and weekends doing this farm thing? Is it really worthwhile? Could I be doing something else with that time? And so my record keeping system allows me to help answer that question with numbers and facts so that I can justify both of our times, my wife and I doing the things that we do on the farm and feel that we're accomplishing something other than just that's our hobby. And so if it's a hobby, great, that's fine. But if we really expect it to be part of our family living, our family income, we need to have a record keeping system. And again, back to the why and what kind of details we need is all part of this conversation. Another thing that I've observed um, in, in the details of record keeping is just tracking our farm, or excuse me, our family spending. And what does that look like? When sometimes our finances are really merged together, maybe in, in one checking account, maybe um, the details, if we want to and should, start to track what's the performance of the farm versus what's the expenses of our family living expenses. And, and I, am I really taking my off-farm income to subsidize the success of the farm or the business? And so that can be all parts of the reasons why we do any kind of record keeping. And so you might agree um, if you're not a, you know, a numbers nerd, maybe like myself, you might agree that farm record keeping is not particularly the most exciting work that happens in the farm business. Maybe for some that is, but for others on the farm business, that's where the details get lost and it's not a comfort level. It's not their first go-to. If they look at the top five things to do today, where does record keeping and farm financial management fall into that top five? And so if that's not really part of the details of that day, the details get lost and we may not have a good picture of what's happening with the farm business. And so it's not particularly exciting work, but it can be helpful when we do in fact dive, dive into some of those details. Okay, so again, why do we need to have some financial record keeping? Um, in my experience, sitting around other kitchen tables on farms, as I've advised and provided some background to financial record keeping, farms find themselves in this, in this indecisiveness when it comes to decision making. And there are some scientifically known um, miseries of indecisiveness that arise. And so one misery of indecisiveness is that we only look for evidence about a decision that is gonna confirm what we already want to do, meaning, I want to buy that piece of equipment or we need to sell the cows or we need to buy this land or or bring a partner or excuse a partner in, in or out of the business. And so sometimes we, if we're not careful, if we're not looking into the details of our record keeping system, we might jump to a conclusion based on what we are convinced is the answer without knowing what the numbers or the record is actually telling us. So that can be a, a misery of indecisiveness just by looking for just only our own confirming evidence of what we think should happen. Another one that families find themselves in is a false hope. And this is a misery of indecisiveness, meaning that there's this false hope of something miraculously is gonna happen to either turn the farm around or create an opportunity for a new market to open up or a, 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 new, a family member returning to the business or quitting my off farm job. Okay, so there's a false hope that there's this miraculous thing that's going to happen. Well, record keeping can help us avoid that false hope, misery of indecisiveness, because, um, you know, numbers can be very telling if we are accurate and we're keeping them at the detail that we need. And so those are just a few examples of how uh, we find ourselves maybe around a kitchen table when, in fact, 
we're struggling to make a decision or finding a pathway, how do we get on the other side of this decision and feel comfortable that the answer that we came up with, yes or no, was the correct one for the family first and then the business as well. And so that can be part of that, the devil's in the detail. So when it comes to record keeping, um, it's never, in my opinion, one person's job to be part of this record keeping conversation. Because um, if there are in fact two people that are involved in the business, let's say a bookkeeper and a, a person that's more in charge of the sales and the expenses, the purchases, all those things that are happening. Uh, I'll give you an example. If, if I'm the purchaser or the seller and I'm going out and I'm either forward contracting the commodity or I'm making a purchase, let's say for example, it's fertilizer. And if, if down the road months away, I want a report that says this fertilizer is assigned to this crop, to this field for this, this purpose, and this type of fertilizer, if I don't do a good job communicating that with my bookkeeper, if it's another person, I really can't expect that report to tell me those details at the end of the year or the end of the half year or the quarterly report. And so I must be to really communicate the, when I go out and make a purchase, I must have the ability to either track that and either write on that receipt or communicate that transaction with my bookkeeper. And it was interesting at our extension office, we have this hallway between soil and water and farm service agency and the extension office. And I was talking with a colleague down in the hallway and I overheard this exact conversation just two weeks ago in the hallway about the bookkeeper was frustrated because the, um, the program, the farm service agency program that they were enrolling into required a certain level of detail. And the bookkeeper was extremely frustrated with the spouse, we'll just say it that way, that the details were not being communicated on these expenses so that then the bookkeeper was having a very difficult time communicating with the, the program enrollment. And it was really slowing down this process of program enrollment there was a deadline approaching, a planting date approaching, and so there was there was some level of frustration that that we could that we experienced in that conversation. So that was a, kind of a reminder about that really that tremendous amount of need to communicate between those that are that are out selling our commodities or from the farm or making those purchases, and how do we actually get that into a record keeping system? Let me pause there just for a second and uh, see if there's any questions as we kind of dove in for just a few minutes here so far in this topic. Because I'm pretty sure that Gigi said, don't be bashful today. Unmute, ask your, ask your question. You are also welcome to type it in the chat. Okay. so. Feel free to continue to chime in or chime in when when you when you have it. Okay. So one part of communication that I have seen frustration with is multi-generational. Um, and and too often there is a, a really a perspective that's not not necessarily valued, but not perceived between sometimes in a farm business between the senior generation and maybe the junior generation. And so it's my opinion, I'll start with my opinion again. I think I've said that a few times here so far, but my opinion is based on what I've seen around the kitchen tables is that it's my opinion that it is the senior generation's responsibility to provide leadership in this conversation about how the business uh, should function, about how this record keeping can and does work. If it's a big mystery to the junior generation, there's really gonna be a mystery about do I really want to be a part of this farm business? Because, you know, sometimes mom and dad make it look really easy, but maybe sometimes the junior generation just doesn't get all of the details as to really how did mom and dad really make it look so easy? Now, there are some reluctance to that, that's that conversation between the senior generation and the junior generation. And one of my perspectives is the senior generation might even say, well, 
I don't want to tell the junior generation all of the hard days and years that we had. They were young, you know, the junior generation was young. They don't remember how much of a struggle it was. And so there may be this, this level of pride that the senior generation may want to protect the junior generation on some of the uncertainties that are bound to happen in a farming business, the ups and the downs. Uh, how do we get through the down years by having just maybe a few up years that are that are in our history? And so um, sometimes the senior generation also, um, they have made mistakes. They may have put themselves in a financial position that maybe they're you know, they look at their peers at their own age, the senior generation. I've, I've been at that kitchen table where they're not as proud of all of the financial positions that they've taken, whether that's debt or they're very successful and they've been debt free for 20 years and they don't want to be boastful about that as well as from the senior generation. Senior generation sometimes in that situation can be modest, but at the same time, the junior generation wants to learn, well, how did you become debt-free? What, what did that look like back then? How would a person today become debt-free and be careful of some of the decisions that, that I may be tempted to make today that would prevent me from being successful as a, maybe a debt-free or have a limited amount of debt on a farm business? Maybe that's long-term debt, or how do I get halfway? How do I become operationally debt-free from an operations budget? but I still have land debt that, that is out there. How do I meet halfway and become part of that? Sometimes the senior generation also <laughs> looks kind of down the nose a little bit at the junior generation as to the lifestyle that maybe the junior generation may be demonstrating. And so how do we communicate that? You know, the junior generation, it's different than it was decades ago when when the lifestyles, the junior generation would say, we didn't have all the options to have all these bells and whistles in life that we do today. You know, um, but the senior generation would say, you know, do you really need that new vehicle or that next shiny something or other? Or do you have to take those kind of vacations that, well, when when I was younger and when we were younger as a family, we never took a vacation. So there's there's these differences on how the lifestyle of the junior generation lives and spends money compared to maybe that generation before of the senior generation. And that can be a communication barrier when it comes to how does the farm function and how do we learn about finances and how do we do a better job? Bruce, we've got a couple comments here in the chat. Um, Betsy says she relates to that misery of the indecision idea. And then Heather uh, mentioned back to her that she thinks uh, many of us do and can speak to a recent decision in their family beef cattle operation regarding purchasing uh, some missing pieces that would like to be included in the family that could benefit uh, her daughter's herd. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. So the misery, yeah. So so whether it's the details or, or a lack of communication, I think this can all lead to this misery. Not that farm life is, miser is a misery. It's not no. a lot. It's so often a choice that we make, um, but on the surface, it looks like we're living this uh, perfect rural life, but as we dig a little deeper, what are some of the roots of why decisions are difficult? Why is there uh, sometimes a, not a mistrust, but an uncertainty about the future by the senior generation or the junior generation? Sometimes it's that lack of communication or, or just a not a not value in that perception that how does my senior if I'm the junior generation how does the senior generation view me and it, and there's probably some validity in how that that perception is made but also then how does the junior generation perceive the the senior generation and how do we come to an agreement that in fact we have more things in common than we have separate in so many examples of these farm farm businesses. So thanks for the comments and the and the kudos there on on kind of the miseries of indecisiveness. A um, couple of other things on the junior and senior generation is that I also think it's the senior generation's uh, kind of responsibility to really 
intentionally share to the junior generation about how did dad or grandpa really build that relationship with the retailers? Um, how did they build that relationship with landlords? How did they establish that relationship with the market? You know, going in there and talking with the market manager and and kind of learning from how do we do business as as a family and a business unit? And Even so, those neighbors nearby that are not necessarily farmers, they're just neighbors out in the rural community. You've got to have a good relationship and communicate with them also. For sure. And I think that should be intentional on how the senior generation intentionally takes maybe the junior generation with them to some of those meetings, especially going to see the lender, especially going to see the retail um, sales folks that are how are decisions made about, well, what kind of feed costs or feed are we purchasing for the farm and the, and the beef operation? Or why do we buy a certain brand of seed? Or or uh, how do we make decisions on fertilizer? Are we just uh, always taking the word of the sales staff? Or how involved is the senior generation in those decision making? And so personally, um, you know, my son and I, um, we're, we're experiencing this right now. And so my intention is to in involve my son in those meetings on our farm operation so that uh, he, he, uh, he sees that how that conversation happens about, well, when do we make grain marketing decisions? How do we make a position when it comes to, I'm halfway through the growing season, and I'm 50% sold, but I want to make sure I'm 80% sold before we get to market because it relates to our crop insurance revenue coverage program. So engaging and engaging and, and observing those conversations can be very much an educational opportunity for the junior generation. And that can be difficult because sometimes the junior generation is off farm working. And sometimes maybe those, those meetings happen during the business day, but we have to be intentional about how the senior generation is providing leadership and that involves communication to the junior generation on how these skills are transitioned from one generation to the next. And that's also going to say that it's uh, sometimes difficult also in regards to making, getting the two parties to sit down and just have a conversation. Sometimes that's the most challenging part of mm -hmm. opening up that communication. Yeah, and and I'll go back to my beginning statement of this section was, my opinion is it's the senior generation's responsibility to initiate that conversation or at least have ears open to when the junior generation begins to ask those questions, the senior generation should not just pass them off. And then let's talk about that in the wintertime because we're busy with the cattle or we're busy with the crops. Um, the senior generation needs to recognize when those questions are being asked and, and take the time to really dedicate and have those impromptu meetings and, and teachable moments about what the farm business is. It could be a simple conversation of, you know, how are we reporting transactions in this ledger or this software? How does, how does mom do that? How does, how does she print reports? How does he or she make these decisions with the retailers? Um, if the senior generation is is tuned into that conversation, that's a valuable moment in that. So we got a question for you that says, can you talk about how certain members of the family or operation have expectations from others? For example, in my family, I often find that no one wants to be the one to make the decision. And so I find myself asking all the tough questions or stating the tough facts, like we currently are, uh, asset rich and cash poor, or we need to spend some money this year. In this role, I feel that other family members, despite not wanting to make the decision, has trouble accepting or communicating how they feel about the decision. Oh boy, yeah. And, and some of that is, I would put that in the category of somewhat not taking ownership in the business that they are all involved in. Meaning, and that sounds, maybe that sounds kind of harsh, but, if, if no one's willing to make a decision or they're willing to say, well, that wasn't my decision, if it went poorly, are, they, are the parties involved 
uh, going to be in the position to point fingers and say, this is why the farm failed, or uh, that would be a worst case scenario, in my, in my opinion. Worst case scenario would be finger pointing because of lack of decision making. So expectations just in, in really any job. And so if, if any of us have a supervisor or an employer uh, outside of a farm structure, usually a supervisor is gonna have a acknowledged conversation about what the expectations are as far as how we operate as a group or how we operate as an individual. And so if the senior generation is reluctant to make decisions because, well, someday this farm is gonna be theirs and I don't wanna make this decision, the junior generation might be wanting that input from the senior generation so that the junior generation can learn from that experience. But the, the group in, in, in whole there, as, as it's described, the expectation is that we need to talk about how decisions are made on the farm today. If it is truly a, if the junior generation is just clearly an employee of the farm, decisions need to be made by the senior generation. If it is more of a, a joint uh, partnership, not necessarily a formal partnership, but if it is truly a, a, a business that values those opinions and the expectation should be that those decisions are openly discussed and we rank the pros and cons and we make decisions as a group and nobody leaves that kitchen table until we agree that that's the right decision, not just for the senior generation, but also for the, the junior gen generation. Because there's the hope. Yeah, because there may be consequences for the good consequences for the junior generation by making that decision. Um, and it may put the, the farm business in the correct trajectory that really to, to help improve that farm. Yeah, great, great comments. Any Hopefully. questions out there in the virtual land? And sir, you are more than welcome to ask questions right here at our kitchen table. We're talking about communication and record keeping to improve the farm management. Well, it's kind of interesting. What got me in here was that woman in agriculture. I'm in these chairs, but we're coming. I got to listen to what you guys are talking about. And I got a son. Thirty years into the operation, and uh, he worked for me. He worked for me as a paid employee after I got out of college, and then we got in that, we're in an LLC, and uh, I'm semi-retired. He's pretty much taking stuff over. <laughs> I mean, I, well, something he wants to do, I don't want to do it. I say I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but but I tell you. Transferring management decisions to him, which I needed to do. He's 32 years old and he needed to do it. Um, the most difficult thing I've ever done. Because I, I, you know, I've been coming, I plan my first wheat drop in the fall of 65. So I've been doing it for a few years. And, and I can see him maybe making some mistakes that are mistakes. He should maybe do it. A little bit differently, uh, and sometimes he didn't want to listen to me. And, and and I'm not saying he's wrong, but they're saying that he wants to do what I wouldn't necessarily do. But they're saying he wants to do the probably the right thing to do. You know, it's it's hard for me to kind of let go, but I have to. You know, I have to. Yeah. But it it was probably the hardest thing I ever. Done. And I didn't want to be in partnership with him because I knew he probably couldn't get it all. You know, if I was, if I told him I thought the cattle needed to be bedded and he didn't want to do it, um, you know, this wouldn't get involved. I don't think we'd be throwing pitchforks to each other. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he's he's wired a little bit different than I am, oh, which yeah. is okay. Yeah. You know, I agree. Um, and as as we sit around kitchen tables, everybody is wired a little different. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and part of the the women in ag program, one of the programs that they do is called Colors. And Colors talks about well, how how is my 
you know, thought process wired compared to maybe somebody else in the same business. And it, I appreciate that because it reinforces that. How do we appreciate that other generation from the perspective that they see the farm business and where it's been and that next generation, that, that perspective from both lenses as we look to each other for success. And I love your quote that that might've been the toughest decision you ever made to, to, uh, to pass along uh, to a, uh, the management decisions. But you know, when he was younger, I, I took him to the bank with me to talk to the lender. We went to co op together and talked to the feed salesman together for the most part. Uh, he's pretty much doing all that himself now, you know, uh, which, you know, he needs to do. I mean, he's a good good kid. It took me 32 years to get him. <laughs> so you've been interviewing him for 32 years. <laughs> so they that too. Yeah. Yeah, but actually, I'm on the storm water board in Provo County, and we had our annual meeting a month or so ago. And there was a gal at the restaurant. We had a gal that was a speaker. She's from Butler County, probably 23 years old, graduated from high state. Just, and, and I guess she was a state officer. She is a dynamic speaker. Absolutely dynamic. And she uh, in the dairy business, and she went northern and northern Ohio someplace, and and bought equipment to process the milk. And they're processing their own milk and and bottling it. And uh, I, I was just. I mean, just really impressive. She'd be an excellent speaker. You could maybe talk about some of these same issues that she would talk about there. And I can't remember her name. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she uh, she might be of use to you on different programs. Eric is something, but I can't remember what it is. All right, well. I've rushed long enough. I need to keep walking. Well, I appreciate your comments there. It, it, that was profound, um, the way that generational transfer of management. We weren't even talking of assets. We were talking of the management decision-making, and that could either be a lot of different things on a farm from a farm management standpoint. It could be the bookkeeping, the record-keeping. It could be the day-to-day -day decision-makings of all the inputs and sales, everything. Well, he's doing all the record-keeping, or his wife is doing the record-keeping. I absolutely despise doing the crop insurance stuff, and and uh, I just hated that. I, I'm I'm more of an outside guy, and if I'm sitting in the house doing book work, I think I'm not doing I'm not doing that. <laughs> but, but you really are. Yeah, probably, and maybe making me more money than being out taking care of the cattle, you know. Yeah. But uh, but you know they do that. And, But it'll, and then, and then, like you said, we set up, we're set up in an LLC and you know, he's buying the machinery and I gave him a few shares to start him out. We've got a question you know, in the chat from Betsy again. So if you're ready, Bruce, what kinds of resources um, that show what types of details to track? And what is the difference between a balance sheet and just income and expenses? Yeah, thank you, uh, Betsy. Uh, so the question is what kind of resources that show the different types of details to tr track? So when you say resources, are you talking uh, specifically about a record keeping system? Where, where do we put those transactions? Is that Am I reading that question maybe correctly? What kinds of resources that show what type of details to track? Um, if it's the type of detail, uh, for example, the different details on a farm that might pertain to uh, a record keeping system. So a record keeping system could be anything from a paper pencil ledger to a computer spreadsheet that the uh, bookkeeper um, develops themselves. 
uh, extension universities have uh, record keeping systems that are available as downloadable spreadsheets. The University of Missouri really has a great uh, spreadsheet that mirror images what we would call the Ohio ledger book or the Ohio commercial record keeping ledger here in Ohio. Or you could get into some software that actually would be tracking the numbers in a, in a financial package. So um, the non-farm ones that we often see on the farm are, are software like Quicken or QuickBooks. Uh, both of those can be very adaptable to farm record keeping. And then you can get into some additional software that are, are written just for farm businesses. Uh, and those could be on display here at Farm Science Review. Uh, I had a top 10 list that I had. I don't have that one with me today, but there were there's definitely some to be purchased financial software out there specifically made for farms. But how do we know what detail to track? And so the first level of detail that back to my statement of why do we do records? Uh, the first uh, framework to keep records with is the Schedule F because ultimately we're each going to have to to submit and file a Schedule F farm record. And so it breaks down things pretty simply, seed, chemical, fertilizer, feed purchased, and then it gets into supplies, repairs, and so on. And so uh, that's that Schedule F can serve as somewhat of a guide to start with. Now, again, my other statement about the Schedule F as a financial uh, statement, it is the worst financial statement for you to make any decisions about your farm. Did we make money or did we lose money? Please don't look at your Schedule F to really get a solid answer to that question. We need to do a little bit more. So the second part of your question was, what's the difference between a balance sheet and just having income and expenses? And so I'll answer that by go doing more than just a tax return. So the tax return has value because it really has tracked over the course of that fiscal year, all the income and all the expenses for the farm business. And so those are very important to have. However, to add value to those income and expenses, we wanna do an accrual adjustment based on balance sheets. And so a balance sheet is a snapshot in time. So every January 1st, let's say, you would take a look at all of the farm assets and all the liabilities. Your assets would include cash. Your assets would include all of the assets that can be turned quickly into cash. So if you had grain and storage, uh, or you had feeder cattle or feeder lambs uh, that are ready for market, they could be quickly turned into cash. And so that's an asset, very liquid asset. We can turn it into cash. Then we have intermediate assets that maybe our breeding stock, maybe the value of that cattle herd. We're not going to go out and sell the cows per se, but there's value there that are intermediate. They're not long-term, but they're intermediate. But then we have long-term assets like building and land. So that's half of the balance sheet. And sometimes those inventories of all those assets will change from one year to the next. On the opposite side of the balance sheet, we have to talk about the liabilities. And so the, the current liabilities, what bills are due in the next 30 days or 60 days, that would be a current liability. Any interest that's owed or interest paid in the next uh, six months would be a, a current liability. Intermediate liabilities would be those loans, like an operating loan. What's the principal balance on the operating loan that we, sh we need to pay within the next six to 12 months? But then the long-term loans are going to be loans that are long-term for land and buildings and other, other long-term assets. So that's the quick version of what a balance sheet is. So I tell you those things because we need to match up that balance sheet with all of those income and expenses. If we don't, and here's the reason why we need to, is because if we don't, if we just look at our tax return every year, the tax return might show us as having plenty of cash, plenty of liquid assets. We're getting by, we're living. Okay, there's cash in the checkbook. We're doing fine. But what it ignores is that we may have cash in the checkbook because we've actually depleted other assets that are long-term gonna be a decline on the farm financial health. For example, 
three years ago, we might have had tens of hundreds of thousands of bushels of grain in storage. That's not reflected on the cash or the, the schedule F to the IRS. But over the last three years, let's say, well, the reason we have cash in our checking account is because we no longer have that inventory. And so we've lost an asset to lean back on. And so if we've ignored that balance sheet, research has shown if we only look at the tax return as an indicator of financial strength, we could have a easily a three-year lag in knowing really where the financial stability or strength is of the farm. So we definitely need the income and expenses that the tax return does report, but, but getting some help uh, and matching that up with a balance sheet to do an accrual adjusted income statement that takes into account the overall farm net worth, but also the farm net income as a result of changes in inventory. So the farm could be getting better and we don't know it, or the farm could be getting worse if we're not taking a look at our balance sheet once a year. And I think it's a prime time to do that. We have those books open to work with the IRS responsibility. We might as well go just a couple steps further, get some help from your CPA or OSU extension through farm financial analysis. Just take that next step forward and get a better picture of the farm stability. So hopefully that answers some of the questions and Heather, thanks for dropping in some of those uh, uh, farm account books and the one from University of Missouri, those spreadsheets and, and information can be very helpful. So I see the note here about the small farm, they use a OSU farm account book and then the daughter has an FSA youth loan. They provided her with a farm record keeping journal, excellent. A lot of banks, uh, whether it's a bank or a ag credit, farm credit institution, they want to help their customers and they might provide that same book of record keeping uh, with a you know customer appreciation once a year, you can get that taken care of. Uh, so that can be part of the record keeping system. And a lot of times those booklets, we think of computers doing the analysis. No, those ledgers and those farm account books also have summary pages that we transfer those income to an income summary. And then those summary tables get built into some of the analysis that I mentioned and even building a balance sheet to really make a more robust income statement for the farm. Some of you might be just scratching your heads and saying, oh, he just went way over my head. <laughs> Numbers are not my thing. You know, I was, I was with him right up until you know, the checkbook, they schedule F, but then we got into this whole thing about an income statement and a balance sheet. And so whether that's a frustration, I believe it's one of those details that through the Women in Ag program, just diving a little bit deeper into what that detail is, the devil may be in the detail, but it may be something that as an outcome can really, really polish our ability on the farm to be successful. Way over my head, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yep, sorry about that. So um, this is gonna take some, a little bit of homework and uh, just, I encourage you to stay engaged with the Women in Ag program and, if, and uh, and, and really, if it comes down to getting consultation across the kitchen table and diving a little bit deeper, that's where I think we in Extension pride ourselves in building that relationship with the farm business around the kitchen table to really deliver the resources that that farm business needs. Because there is no one record keeping system that's gonna work for my farm, Gigi's farm, anybody that's sitting around this table today there's no one system that works for everybody. And so I think it's uh, good to ask questions. Well, what do we wanna get out of our record keeping system? What are we lacking? What don't I know about my business that would make these decisions maybe a little bit better? Do I even wanna transfer this business to the next generation? Is it even 
worth transferring or do we just need to transfer assets but not transfer the management of a true business to the next generation? Maybe the junior generation can own the farmland and they cash rent it out. That's a tough decision. Yeah. And the junior generation might feel uh, that they let the senior generation down by finding themselves in that situation. But if the numbers, if the senior generation and the junior generation come to that conclusion and realization that that lifestyle of the past and the things that we did on the farm is just not a good fit for the next generation, there can still be happy days ahead for both the senior and the junior generation if that is the outcome of that decision. I'm not advocating for that, but some of those, sometimes that's the tough conversation around these kitchen tables. So Heather's added the farm profitability link in there in the chat. So you are welcome to grab that. And then also noting that the uh, Ohio Farm Business Analysis and Benchmarking Program is a very good resource to use also. And the other thing to think about Betsy is not sure where you are located, but to find any of our county extension offices, all you have to do is put in the county name .osu.edu. So for example, I'm in Claremont. So it would be claremont.osu.edu and then find your county extension office and they could possibly sit down with you and have this, may, might be across the desk or it might be across your kitchen table, but be able to have that conversation. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and my role in this whole conversation has really been about um, there are other experts at OSU that do the farm business analysis. My role in the past 10, 15 years has been, how do we get people to where they want to be with their farm record keeping? Maybe it's just to get them to do a timely, stress-free or less stress tax return. How do we get to the uh, January 15th and feel like, gosh, I do have everything right here and it's not so stressful to make that appointment with the CPA or for me to file my own tax return. That is a, that's a, if that, some might say that's a simple goal, but that could be a tremendously valuable goal to have for a farm business. And so, but maybe the goal is I already do a decent job of, of really having my tax return done, but I wanna go the next step. And so my role in extension here in the, again, 10, 15 years has been, how do we get people from where they're at to the next step in record keeping to where they want to be? So it's, it's helpful for them. Thanks for joining. We're just talking about um, record keeping and uh, kind of the devils in the detail and how conversations are important when it comes to improving farm management around, around the table, kitchen table today. So. Hi, this is Betsy. Other questions are coming. Go ahead, Betsy. I got to chime in. I, um, I think we're in a pretty good situation. We, our family has had a farm since 1831, and I start gonna cry. My daughter's taking it over, and she's just doing a fantastic job. Excuse me. And uh, I'm doing the taxes for them. So like I like numbers. So I'm just I'm just like what you just said. What else can I do? I mean, like I do taxes. So like, OK, I get that part. But then all this net worth and liabilities and we've made an LLC and we have to set up the balance sheet. And I was like, I don't even know where to get those numbers and how to do that. And so. I think this ONU, OSU stuff would be be good for me because, you know, she's in the field and I can do this. You know, it's it's really nice because dad's still in the picture. He's I, I, I kid her like like you were talking about. She she went and she got a master's degree at Purdue. But I said, you need to go home and get your grandpa degree because he has all that wisdom. <laughs> So of all true. these years that he's farmed and so she's doing that and now he's backing off and so it's it's crazy and it's just so much more complicated now with all the farm programs and the insurance I mean there's a lot more going on as he went through you know his farming career so 
Um, yeah, it's just like she does a great job record keeping, but it's mostly income and expenses, and yep, we don't have a good handle on the net worth and the and the balance sheet, that kind of thing. So that, that's where I think the benchmarking program, don't you, Bruce? Like working with yeah, someone I, that can really help. Yeah, yeah, and the analysis and uh, and so there are resources here to help that along the way, Betsy. You don't have to lift that all by yourself, nope. and and I don't think anybody really expects every farm um, farm manager to, to do that lift. Some lenders will help with that, um, but I'll be, I'll be truthful when it comes to the lender profession. The paperwork that our farm gives the bank once a year is really to ensure that the bank, if I default, they're gonna get their settlement back to the bank they're protecting the bank's asset now some bank and that that's not a criticism that's not saying that they don't care about me or our business as a is it profitable or or is it not their their number one reason for for them to receive a balance sheet and income information is to know that their customers are a solid non-default customer so um they can still be a tremendous asset and the bank may have some analysis available, uh, but OSU Extension, uh, we are building a robust team to do exactly that type of support across Ohio. And another great thing you mentioned, Betsy, was risk management. You mentioned crop insurance. So when your daughter talks to grandpa, his level of risk management or risk exposure may be much different than your daughter's because his balance sheet may be looking pretty strong and he can withstand a bad year or a bad two years. Whereas maybe your daughter's balance sheet right now today may be a little bit more vulnerable to a one bad year. I feel that's the case with my son. And that's why he and I, we've pursued some ways of, of managing risk because his balance sheet is going to look different than my dad, who also farms separately. And so it's a total different conversations. But I bet Grandpa could reinforce the frequency of, of those down years and knowing that and asking that question, Grandpa, how did you survive those bad years? And, and honestly, Grandpa might say back in those decades, there was not such a thing as crop insurance. It was not as heavily supported by U.S. Department of Agriculture funds to make those premiums affordable today for your daughter and others in that same generation of entering into farming. So um, risk management and our exposure to risk is tremendously different from one generation to the next. Well said, Betsy, thanks for bringing that up. And congratulations, 1,800 and what did you say? How many? 31, 1831. 1831, yeah. 1831 that's impressive. I hope you're applying for um, the High Department of Agriculture um, Century Farm Awards, whatever they're called. They do multiple centuries, 100, but um, there's bicentennial awards. They have different categories. So, so some of the things that, um, you know, the junior generation might, as they have those multi-generation conversations. I have a list of things that, you know, what do we need to listen for as a junior generation to really acknowledge what the senior generation is telling us? And so, you know, my son has told me a few of these things and I've heard other young or newer generation farmers asking and, and zeroing in on a few things. So the junior gener generation needs to be thinking about profitability per acre versus yield per acre. Too often at the coffee shop, stereotypically, um, farmers might talk yield per acre. What they don't talk about is what really pays the bill at the end of the year is profitability per, per acre or per cow, per ewe, per sow, per building, whatever your unit of sales is per acre of pumpkins, per, per day of a... a uh, agritourism event. Okay. So, so profitability per unit versus just, Hey, we had 10,000 people come through the farm today. That doesn't necessarily mean we made money. Yeah. 
So that's something for the junior generation to zero in on. And one with Betsy, we already mentioned this understanding risk and, and, vol and volatility. That's another thing that the junior generation needs to, I, I think, to zero in on. Return on investment is another thing that I think uh, that communication, that, um, how does she call it, grandpa degree? Grandpa degree. Grandpa, grandpa degree. degree. Yep. Um, return on investment. You know, what did the senior generation feel was that best investment that they ever made? Was it that farm that they paid too much for? Was it that used piece of equipment versus a new one? Was it those 10 cows that I was in the right place at the right time and I had cash to spend versus borrowing money to do something? And, you know, those kind of things are conversations to pick up on. Other things to pick up on would be community trends, industry trends. You know, livestock looks different than it did 20 years ago with vertical integration of swine and poultry. And but there may be some opportunity to be a part of that, even though that I, you know, I might not have my independent sow, sow operation feral to finish, but is there an opportunity to to have livestock yet that would complement uh, crop acres? And then another thing to keep an eye on would be uh, really margins and utilizing our assets and financing. You know, if we are going to borrow money, coming back to that return on investment, um, what is that? What do those margins look like? And how do we track a margin on the farm? Some of that's going to come back to the details in our record keeping so that am I a better corn producer or am I better pumpkins or am I better with people coming to the farm? Or what is my niche that I have? Maybe it's freezer beef or freezer lamb. Um, you know, what, is, what am I good at? But if I'm good at it, am I profitable at it? And so uh, those are some things that I would suggest to the junior generation to make sure that as we have these conversations, kind of zero in on and um, I, I honestly don't think that the senior generation would be offended by the junior generation asking a few more questions because grandpa or dad or mom or grandma may be very willing to share that experience. Um, knowing that that junior generation really cares and they see a future in the farm and on that land. Senior generation sometimes talking about the future of farming. Well, if they really want that future to happen, uh, they need to take some leadership in making sure that things transition and knowledge is, is gained by the junior generation. I sound kind of forceful in this, but <laughs> I mean, if I can't be forceful and raise awareness of this, I I think it just goes unsaid. It becomes taboo of things that we don't talk about. And that would be bad if, if it just remains taboo. Bruce, I've so always thought here. too that you, um, you have the ability right to share and sharing family history, family stories um, is one way to kind of preserve, you know, the, the family side of things. But I tell farmers sometimes this is this is your contribution to the future, right? Like, you know, we talk about so many times I was born on this date and the person, you know, passed away on this date. But um, some of the most poetic things are that dash in between. So don't leave out the important farm dash, right? The dash of, of generation, like Betsy said, 1831 to as long as you can go. So 200 years of getting close to 200 years of farming. Um, just within that family. So, you know, making sure that it's, you know, some farmers will say, I want to leave it to, to the next generation better than I received it, right? And so part of that is being able to share knowledge and wisdom, which may not be seen as such. I think of the gentleman sitting there in the tent with you all. Um, sometimes that younger generation doesn't always see that right as an advantage, but it truly, truly is to talk about um, the challenges and things that have been seen over time. So, communication to be able to do and plan for that transition. The worst thing that could happen is that you're not having, I think, those conversations. And that's some of the things that David, I know um, that the farm management team does talk about, right? And that succession planning. So, um, but share that story, share it with, you know, with those family members, the, the folks that are engaged in that so that they know um, 
you know, that's that's like memory organizational knowledge, right? That that we sometimes lose um, over the course of time. So we don't want to we don't want to lose that in a, in our farm in our farm business. Well, as we wrap up our session here today, we want to thank you for joining us this year for our 2022 kitchen table conversations at the Farm Science Review and virtual. I'd like to thank Bruce for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you, Bruce. My pleasure. And once again, these are recorded, so the postings will be shared later, and then you will be able to have that um, as a, a database to go back and view also if you need to re-reference. Re Everyone have a good day. Bruce, um, you, you can, I'm going to type in um, 